Hello and welcome to the Post to Post podcast. This is podcast number 35 on February 11th. My name's Neil. You are Brent. I am Brent. You, you are Brent, a.k.a. Goat. The Goat. Uh, podcast 35. That's a little nuts. A little bit of a milestone. 35 isn't really usually a milestone, but uh, in this case, we'll make it one. Yeah, 35. I don't know. Is it 35? You're allowed to be uh, elected to the United States Senate. <laughs> that's the that's the reference that you've chosen. <laughs> I'm sure lots of people got that at well, thir- You know, there's different ages that, that kick in certain benefits. 18, you can vote. Uh, 19 in Canada, you can drink. 21 in the yeah. States, you can drink. 25, you get cheaper car insurance. You get to rent a car. Yeah. So uh, thir- I don't know what 35 is other than political. Isn't that a marriage thing? At 35, you give someone... I was going to say wood, but that sounds bad. <laughs> Silver or something like that, or um, I, I think I don't know. Is twenty five? I don't think thirty five is a big deal. Twenty five is a big deal. Fifty is yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Thirty five, I don't think is much of a big deal. <laughs> All right. But uh, I'm still excited. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, mm-hmm. uh, I actually don't have a lot to talk about for this podcast. I think it'll end up becoming a normal sized podcast just because a lot of cool things happened this week. Not necessarily just in hockey, but okay. other ways. Sounds yeah. good. I've got about mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven topics, and about five of them are very short. So. Ooh. Uh, did you see that Lars Eller get signed? I oh, did. Wait. Five years. Five years, 3.5 million. Yeah. Average. Good for him. Uh, well, how do you feel about that contract? I feel that uh, it's about right. I think that's about what he's worth, and I think he's young enough that five years is a good term for him. And he's a center, mm-hmm. uh, so I, I look at Montreal's starving for a center and see how they let that go. And uh, mm. uh, good on Washington and good on Eller. We see so many signings, mm. and we're so critical most of the time. Mm. Uh, oh, that's too long. That's too much money. I feel like this is a really good contract. I, like I, this is I right too. in right in the wheelhouse. Yeah, exactly where it needs to be. Yeah, because he's, there's no question he is not the top line center for any team. Mm. But he's third line, good enough to put in and, and get the job done, and he's not too liable. And whenever I watch a game that, that features him uh, playing, which is rarely, but whenever I watch the Capitals playing an, another team, Montreal or whomever, uh, his name is talked about a lot mm-hmm. in the game because he's very involved in the play. And he's not a flashy player. Nope. He's just a hardworking kind of guy you put out there and get stuff done. And yeah, he's a little streaky, just a little. Oh, yeah, he, he is a bit streaky. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, overall solid. I think it was a great uh, pickup. Yeah, good, and, good uh, uh, contract. Yeah, good signing by Washington. Yep. Uh, and speaking of Washington, that is my segue into what's on the screen here. So this was released a couple of, well, not a couple months ago, maybe a month ago. Have you seen this jersey before? I don't think I have. So for you audio listeners, I'm showing a, a picture on the screen of the Washington Capitals upcoming stadium series jersey. Oh, okay. Against Toronto, I believe. Uh, what are your thoughts on that jersey? It doesn't look like a special event jersey to me. Really? I don't mind it. I, I think it looks fine, but I don't know. I I like everything about it except for that giant red bar at the bottom. It's too thick. Okay. It feels like it doesn't fit the jersey at all. Uh, I wish it was white, actually. But other than that, I do like it. Yeah. So speaking of the same game, mm-hmm. Toronto oh. released theirs. This week, what do you think of that? I love it. Yeah, I like it too. I just love it. I usually don't like white jerseys a lot, but mm-hmm. I really like that one. Well, lately, and I Toronto had another white jersey in a, a few years ago, didn't they? And I really liked it. It was blue with the white stripe. Was it blue? Yeah, okay. we've, we've had this conversation conversation like four times. Four times. Well, when when you when you get to your age and your father gets to my age, that happens a lot. <laughs> and the one for our video listener slash viewers behind you, Neil, the Montreal Canadiens. Yes. Uh, I love that. I, and I'm not a big fan of white either, but when I see that and, and the Montreal one, mm. I really, really like them. Yeah, and the one up there too, the Montreal Canadiens one from this year, mm-hmm. the outdoor game, that white one's nice too. Yeah, but very nice. Yeah, uh, I definitely like it. It looks a little bit like a painter's uniform, <laughs> but uh, not as bad as the LA Kings Stadium Series jersey a couple of years ago. But yeah, I really like that. Mm-hmm. Anyways, that just started. The, the uh, All-Star game. Uh, a week or two ago, yeah. the the team wearing white. Pacific. It was really, really white, but it looked good too. It did. It, I didn't like it when I just saw the jersey just by itself mm-hmm. compared to the other jerseys. But when I saw it on the ice with the rest of the uniform, I actually liked it a lot. Yeah, me too. Yeah. 
Uh, anyways, I just wanted to publicly have that conversation because I get asked 1,000 times a day, what do I think of these jerseys? So now it's out there. Uh, that won't stop the asking. No, it won't. <laughs> uh, I'll show on camera to those watching on YouTube. We picked up two toques here from Lids. One is uh, Canadians, one is the Senators, and this is from the outdoor game that happened in December. So it's the 100, NHL 100 Classic or whatever, whatever they're calling it. So what we're going to do is eventually put these in a frame with the jerseys and have them side by side. So it'll look pretty cool. That will look very cool. Yeah, I got them for, I think, $10 on lids. And I think I was in on one of those hats. And yes, I, had, I got an I have it upstairs. And, and uh, I wore it this morning when I Did went you? out to take my snow measurement at 7 o'clock. Your snow measurement. I measure snow every day. That might have been the, well, that wouldn't have been the nerdiest thing you've ever said on the channel, but no, it's probably oh, by up far. there. And it won't be the last. No. But uh, I, I'm a, an observer, an official observer for weather, uh, precipitation of any kind, but lately it's been snow. And I record it and I post it online on a site called Cocoras. And uh, it's used by scientists to measure uh, weather phenomena. So how did you get into that? Just one day you didn't have anything to do? You thought you'd go outside and measure, measure the snow? No, I got approached by somebody who was involved with the organization. You were approached? I was approached. I was approached. And uh, he emailed me and said, look, we're trying to set up some more observer sites on Prince Edward Island. Would you be willing to be one? And I said, sure. He said, well, uh, I'll drop by with the gear. So he came by with, with the gear. With the gear. There's a, a couple of tubes that gather the precipitation. There's little smaller tubes and a little funnel, and you measure and melt the snow, and each each day you post the results online. This sounds like a potential Patreon video. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be, I guess. I never let, thought of that. Uh, those of you on Patreon, let us know down in the comments, and we'll show you the process. Yeah, and it's definitely not exciting, mm. but I like doing it's, it. I mean, it is. It's exciting in a way because it's unique, and it's a process that probably ninety-nine percent of the world doesn't know how it was done. Mm -hmm. in yeah, a way, there's, there's there's a way to measure snow. There's there's a whole manual on how to do it right. You know, it's not just sticking a ruler in the snow yeah, and yeah. looking at the numbers. You have to not only measure how deep the snow is, but you have to gather a, a core of the snow, melt it down to the liquid equivalent based on the. Uh, the measurement you've got, and then upload all that data. Mm. And it's important data. They need to know this information. So they have uh, measurements from the airport, and they have from here, about four miles away from the airport, and it's surprisingly how different those measurements are. And they use it to compare against the projections days before. And That's right. It, like it that. improves forecasting. Yeah. There's cocoa rass stations all over North America, Canada and the United States. It's mainly an American effort. Canada's come into it a little bit later. But it's very involved all across the country. I'm also a severe weather spotter. So when, severe we, get, weather. when we get hail, uh, severe weather, thunderstorms, uh, with my ham radio hobby, I get on the air or I get on the phone and I check in and report the weather. I was razzing you a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. you know that I know it, that it's important I know. work. So. I know. No, you can razz away. It's fine. <laughs> uh, back to hockey. <laughs> Pierre Dorian was <clears throat> extended for three more years. That's. Uh, but at the same time, the CEO and president were fired. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about this? It it wasn't an arbitrary decision. They sat down with Dorian and said, "Okay." Do you know Do you know where they sat down with him? Uh, Bermuda was it? Barbados. No, Barbados. Yeah, and it was started with a B, and it was palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> Bermuda, Barbados, Bahamas. It wasn't Boston. Bar Barbuda. It was not Boston. No. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it might have been Boca Raton, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, and they sat down and they said, probably before they made their decision whether to hit the eject button yeah. or uh, or not. What are you going to do? What's your plan? And he gave them a plan, and they liked it enough to keep him around for another three years. I think he's a good GM. He's made some mistakes. I do uh, but I do I, I'm, o I'm okay with him, them giving him, I, got, I don't really want to call it a second chance, but mm. um, an additional chance, maybe. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens. There is a bit of a rebuild coming. I don't think it's a full rebuild, more of a, I hate these terms, but a retool. So I, what's the difference, really? But it's, <laughs> it's just a shorter rebuild. Yeah, so. I think a rebuild is a blow it up and a retool is a tinker. <laughs> yeah, like I, I know what it is. It's just. But, yeah, I, I don't know if there's an official distinction there. Uh, I think it's okay. I think it'll work out well for Ottawa. I think they have a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how big their prospect pool is. But I don't either. Um be interesting to see what they do, especially with Carlson. We've had this conversation mm -hmm. 15 times, so we don't have to have it again. But yeah. uh, speaking of blowing it up, the Rangers mm. sent out a letter from 
uh, Glenn Sather and Jeff Gordon, Gordon, mm -hmm. and basically said, you know what, guys, we've tried hard since 2005. We've made the, the cup finals. We've made the conference finals a couple of times. We've got close. We've had great teams, but it's just not working in the last couple of years. We need to uh, rethink our strategy. We need to get rid of some familiar faces. We need to bring in some young, consistent, fast uh, talent into the organization, and you'll see some familiar faces moving out. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, and I, I want to spend a lot of time talking about this because I can see both sides of the argument of why this is wrong or why this is right. I'm on the side that this is the right decision mm -hmm. for so many reasons. <laughs> Number one, as a Canadians fan who wants to see a rebuild and who is not getting any communication from any owner or GM or whatever, if you're a Rangers fan and you're feeling like you're in the same situation, you got to be happy that your team is at least willing to talk to you, mm -hmm. admit that they're trying to do the right thing. Because look at Toronto. They did the same thing. They said came out and they said, you know what? We're tired of the same thing. Year after year, we're going to do a rebuild. And they did. And look at them now. It's like this needs to happen for some teams at certain times. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is exactly the time that New York needs to do this. I'm okay with th with this, this this decision. I'm okay with them being vocal and communicative about it. It's important to the fans. So good on the New York Rangers for doing that. I know a lot of people disagree with me and, and say, well, you should never give up. You should always try and, and keep going and stuff. But, well, they, they're not going to give up. They're still going to try to win games. The players said that. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna, They're not going to tank for a, a pick. They're just saying there's going to be some changes. Well, that's the thing. The Rangers are too high in the standings to tank for a pick. They're, like three, They're only three points, points yeah. out of the wild card, yeah. which I thought, when I first heard that they'd made this statement, and I first saw it on Twitter, uh, a friend of mine, we follow each other on Twitter, his name is Suleiman Ahmed, and he lives in Toronto, but he's a Montreal fan like I am, and uh, we've met, and he's a bit of an aviation buff, and we communicate sometimes. And Suleiman retweeted, the Rangers tweet, which I had not seen because I don't follow them. And I read that and I was just blown away by the frankness mm -hmm. and the the outpouring of information that they know their fan base needs to have. I thought it was a bit premature. This is something you could say in July, as easy as you could say it in February, I except like it. for the fact, and I like it too, for this reason, the deadline's coming up on the 26th of February. That's mm -hmm. only uh, two weeks away, really. And that means they have plans. And they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're telling the fan base two weeks ahead of time or three weeks when they release that, just about, uh, we're about to pull the trigger on some stuff here, so we're just softening you up for the uh, what's oh, going to happen. Exactly, and yeah. It's, it's going to be a Rick Nash, it's going to be Ryan McDonough, it's going to be whatever. And uh, they're going to make some big moves, and they're going to be able to say, don't say we didn't tell you we were going to do it. And they have to do it, and it, like, it is it is a bit preemptive, but I feel like they have to do it because mm -hmm. Hendrik Lundqvist is on the downside of his career. That's right. He only has, what, Five years left, probably at the most. At the very most, he has five years left as as a as a goaltender that can be paid to play in the NHL. I think he has less time left as a goalie that, a goalie that can be relevant. Yeah, that's a good <clears throat> that's a good assessment. So they really need to do this now and give him his one final shot at a cup. Mm -hmm. It's possible. It's Hendrik Lundqvist. Uh, so I feel I feel good about the Rangers that they're doing this because I'm sitting here cheering for the Canadians down in mm -hmm. basically third last spot in the in the East, fourth or fifth last in the entire league. And I'm sitting here listening to the delusional speak of how they're going to make the playoffs and they have a team that can win the cup. How do you watch this team every single day or every single game or whatever and think that they're going to win a cup? That's delusional. It's time for a rebuild. I want to circle back to something you just said because I don't know which way you're, you're intending to go with this. Wanting to give Lundqvist a chance before he, he runs out of time. Do you mean that they're going to move him to a team that's a contender, or they're going to be a contender? They're going to be a contender. Okay. I don't think they move Lundqvist, because Lundqvist doesn't want to move. He loves it there. He's mm -hmm. their leader. He's the most communicative guy on the entire team. Um, he wants to retire there. I don't see him going mm -hmm. anywhere else. If they do, it's a by request of him. Yeah. That's my that's my prediction. Mm, but I, don't, I, I can't see him wanting to leave anywhere, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Crazier things have happened. It's going to be fun to watch what they do. I, I'm not a huge Rangers fan. I am a fan of the market, but uh, the Rangers themselves would, would be down the list a bit of the teams I would cheer for. But uh, good for them that they're talking to their fans. They have a very passionate fan base. Yep. And in a big city that has a lot going on sports-wise, 
They have soccer. They have basketball. They have multiple teams of, of those sports, and they have hockey all over the place and football all over the place. Um, you know, when you have 15 million people in your market area, yeah, that's a lot of eyeballs you're trying to get focused on you, and uh, they realize how important this is to keep those folks happy. Absolutely. That's great. And as, as Canadians fans who have seen their team be eliminated by the Rangers twice in the last four years, mm-hmm. you think that we would hate them, but I think it's kind of the opposite where we've, we've moved them up on our list a little bit more because our love for the city, because we love New York City so much mm-hmm. that I think a dream would be to see a game in the Madison Square Garden. No question. I'd love to do that. That'd be awesome. I certainly don't have a hate on for the Rangers. Individual players like Chris Kreider, I, I have a bad taste in my mouth I for. Think, I think every Canadian's player yeah. has, a, has a hatred on for yeah. Chris Kreider. Yeah. And, you know, so other than that, though, the, the team itself, I, I have no problem with them. I think they're a, a very important part mm. of what the NHL needs to be to be a successful sports operation. Uh, they're a historic uh, integral part of the league, and they need to be doing well for the league to do well. So mm. good for them. How would you feel if Carlson went to the Rangers? From Ottawa? Yeah. So you'd have a back end of McDonough, Carlson, Shattenkirk, Brady Shea. Make them pretty formidable. It would be interesting. Mm-hmm. But It would be interesting. I think based on the tone of the letter, I don't think that's the plan. I think the plan is to... To not acquire existing super, st- I, I think it, it sounds more like a rebuild type letter. Uh, I know you're thinking that they can build it in time that Lundqvist can still be backstopping the team to the cup. I don't know if it can happen that fast though with a letter like that. It sounds to me like they're going to blow it up, and I don't know. I don't know. I think I think there's been lots of talk about McDonough. There has been going. lots of talk about McDonough, yeah. And he never really turned out to be the the rocket man he's a good stay at home stay at home defenseman he's mm-hmm. a, become really defensively uh irresponsible yeah. in the past couple of years he's which is w- strange because he never was like that no he's he's made some big breakdowns usually when you you fix your bad habits and it's kind of gone the opposite for him mm-hmm. he's still a good defenseman it's just not the same mcdonough that he was did i read this in a serious sense or a just a whimsical sense that Minnesota would be a good destination for him because of his history. Or did you read that mm. anywhere? I think Minnesota would have to consider moving some defensemen that they wouldn't necessarily want to move mm-hmm. to bring in McDonough, but I don't... It would depend on a few things. Because Minnesota's been known a little bit to do... You know, looking for a hometown discount. Uh, yeah. Worked the rental game. Like, they wanted Vanek badly because he'd played college hockey there. and mm, uh, Never worked out. Never worked out. So I don't know if this would or not. But I, I see that, or I read that somewhere, that mm-hmm. that was a possibility. Where do you think Nash goes? I think Nash. Because he's, I think he, he's going somewhere. I think Nash goes to Ville. He goes to Ville? Nashville. <laughs> uh, oof. That's, the, the Rangers would have to retain a lot of salary, I think. Because I still have to sign Fisher, mm-hmm. who is, and they have, I think, three and a half million free, maybe four. So. How much How much do you think Fisher's going to command, though, when he comes back? They sh- he shouldn't command anything. Right. He should get a million dollars. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think that's going to break the bank when they bring him back. He, I, he should get 500. If he, if he was smart, he'd take the minimum, which is 899,000 or something like that. <laughs> something or, like that, yeah. So that's my minimum too, by the way. <laughs> for Sportsnet. Yeah, <laughs> if you're watching, <laughs> I know I have a face for radio, but you never know. Uh, I think that there's some talk of him going to Boston. Hmm. And I'm not sure how well he fits in there. However, if he sees Boston as, because he submitted his his list of teams that he's willing to be traded to, if he sees Boston as a contender. That's really interesting because there is, I don't want to say a a big chance, but there's a small chance that the Rangers could end up making the playoffs and they could end up playing Boston. Because if Boston passes Tampa and the Rangers sneak in, Boston and the Rangers could end up playing each other and then Nash would end up playing his old team. That'd be interesting. It would be. Unlikely. Great drama. 
unlikely but interesting. Yeah, I think it's a trick pull shot to make all those things happen. I think so too, yeah. But uh, Nash, he isn't getting any younger either, mm -hmm. and he wants to go to a contender. So I think if he has to the ability to, to direct his future in any way, mm -hmm. I don't, he probably doesn't much care where he goes as long as to a team that he can contribute to and maybe win some hardware. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I have a question for you. A little bit of trivia. Oh, Tri no. Trivia that you're you're not gonna go, not going to know. It's just going to require your best guess. Okay. And this is a trivia question as of <clears throat> Saturday morning before last night's games happened. So it might have changed just a couple of spots. All right. The highest seeded Canadians player with points in the league. What position in the league do you think they are? And who do you think it is, and how many points do you think they have? I know, uh, I'm thinking it's Brendan Gallagher. You're close. It's it's Pacioretty with 33 points. Okay. So where... What where is he in the in the NHL in rankings? The overall standings and points. Where do you think the Montreal Canadiens' highest point uh, player is? Wow. Well, the highest point player in the whole league is Kucherov with 69. And he's got 36, you said? 30, 33. 33. As of Saturday morning. I'd say he's 27th. 112th. <laughs> 112th. So the Montreal Canadiens' highest point getter is 112th in the league. In the league. Yeah. You know what? I just guessed he might be 27th, thinking that uh, that was a, quite a discount. He's 112th. 112th. Good God. That tells you how bad Montreal is, and Patrick has had a garbage year. The mm -hmm. fact that he's the, their top point getter as of Saturday morning and is in 112th position in the league tells you everything you need to know about the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. Wow. Um, so Philly wins 10 last year, misses the playoffs. Philly loses 10 this year, currently third in the Metro. I said this a couple of podcasts ago, and by a couple, I mean about 12. Because mm -hmm. I, I joked, I said, because they won 10, 10 last year and missed the playoffs. Does that mean... Won 10 what? 10 games in a row. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. They won 10 games in a row last year and missed the playoffs. All right. They lost 10 games in a row <laughs> earlier this year, and I said, well, does that mean they're going to make the playoffs? And right now, they're in. Right now, they're in. They're right now, they're third in. in the Metro. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's really a... They, they've played well recently. Yeah, it's a two-way tie. Philly and the Devils are virtually tied. That I think Philly has one more regulation win or something than, than New Jersey. But It's so tight that Philly could be in ninth position in the oh, East yeah. uh, very soon. So mm -hmm. just a, a one-day little little fun thing. Yeah, that is good. Did you know, and you probably do, that the, th the top three teams in the Atlantic have more points than any team in the Metro? And the entire Metro Division has more points than the rest of the Atlantic Division. I, That's how much separation there is in the Atlantic mm -hmm. from third to fourth. It's unbelievable. It is unreal. It is. I've well, never seen anything like it. Tampa Bay has 79 points on 55 games. So they're plus 24. Tops in the league. They've had some slips lately, but they're still doing very well. Boston, 74 points on 53 games. So they're plus 21 under my wonky system. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know the system, he's not talking about goal differential. No, I'm talking about points you've earned minus games you've played. Yep. And that that's an easy snapshot way to account for where teams are without having the confounding factor of games in hand and yep. all that kind exactly. of thing. exactly. Toronto has 71 points and 57 games for a plus 14. Toronto will, I don't think Toronto has any chance of catching Boston, but Boston does have a chance of catching Tampa, like you said a minute ago. I warned you guys Three weeks ago when Boston was on a tear, they could pass Tampa. They're only three points back. There are three points in my point system. They're five points back, but they still have two games in hand, so that's mm. how that all works. <clears throat> but then you're right. Going underneath Toronto to look for wild card teams that might come in out of the Atlantic is not going to happen. You've got Florida is the next team with 52 games and 52 points. They're flat. So they're 14 points in the plus system behind Toronto. Yeah. You're never going to catch them. Then you've got Montreal, then you've got Detroit, then you've got Ottawa, and then you've got Buffalo. And it just gets gets progressively dismal it's as you so go down bad. the Atlantic. I it's can't, I awful. Can't, I can't remember there was the last time there was that much separation in a, mm -hmm. in a division. 
It's unbelievable. It is. And the worst team in the Metro is the Rangers that are plus two, 57 points on 55 games played. Mm -hmm. And every team above them, Columbus, Carolina, the Islanders, the Devils, they're all uh, looking at the wild card or have, have a crack at the wild card. And some of them have a crack on third place. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. And even in the West... There's a lot of there's a lot of separation in the West too, especially like near the bottom, of mm -hmm. course. Arizona, do you know that Arizona is potentially trying to shop Max Domi? I did. I saw that. Yeah, because he's not having a good year. He's not having a who, good year. Who's having a good year on Arizona? Keller. <laughs> but even he's kind of. Yeah, I mean, bit. like the air's kind of gone out of that a bit. He's Domi's one of their best young players, and they're thinking of trading him. Why do you think the team doesn't do good year after year? Because this is what they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't get it. That makes no sense. Why, why, why in the league? I can see why they trade someone old to get Domi, but if you've already got Domi, why don't you keep mm -hmm. Domi? I, I don't get it. It, it's it like, doesn't make any it's sense. It's like they're not trying to win. No. Like why, why are you in the league? And I'm not saying that because they're in the desert. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that because nobody in the history of the franchise has been able to manchise, uh, manage that franchise since it came into the league. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, like, has it been the same owner since it came into the league? I, I don't know. Uh, well, they they moved there from Winnipeg, so they were in the league before. Right? No, no, I know, but yeah, since but they came into Phoenix, since they came into Phoenix, yeah. I, I don't like know. If so, something's got to change. Mm -hmm. Like oh. their, their GM's twenty seven years old. That's younger than me. You think I could GM a, a team? Heck no, <laughs> absolutely not. Are you kidding? You're a media mogul. You have almost twenty eight thousand subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I'll, you have. I'll you're ask qualified. them for uh, <laughs> advice on trading and stuff. That'll go over real well. You've got almost five million views. Come on, man! Don't sell yourself short. Yeah, I'll uh, shoot for the stars. Yeah, but you're quite right about where they all are in the standings. Uh, in the West, it's uh, incredible. The, the, the fight for wild card is intense, absolutely intense. It's so close. Dallas, Minnesota, Calgary, Anaheim, and Colorado are five teams fighting over two spots. Well, you have to look at San Jose and, and, mm -hmm. and L.A. there, too. Yep, San Jose and L.A. are, and interestingly, you know, Dallas has 70 points on 56 games. If Dallas was playing in the Pacific Division, they'd be in second place. Yes. But right now they're in a wild card spot yeah. because the Pacific is quite weak compared to the uh I don't know if you noticed the, jer the jerseys behind you. But they're in the order of the standings in the league. So Tampa, Vegas, uh, Boston. I don't have Nashville, so there's no Nashville jersey there. <laughs> uh, Winnipeg, St. Louis, Toronto, Dallas, Washington, Minnesota, San Jose, uh, L.A., and Calgary. That's the you order created. of the league. I'm going to do that. I'm going to update it every single day. I'm going to try to. And uh, I have a video releasing today, which we'll, you guys have, would have already seen. But the problem with that system is sometimes we film three three or four videos a day mm -hmm. and I don't release them for five days after film the video so it's going to look like the order screwed up and people in the comments are going to complain but on the day that we filmed it, it was right so it's I don't know you, you can't win you can't win you can't there, win there, there's no winning but anyway I thought it was an interesting idea and uh, if I ever get a Nashville jersey then I'll include it on the list but there was supposed to be one coming and it has not arrived in a month so Ooh. I assume that that order was cancelled so uh huh I'm missing an Islanders and a uh, Nashville jersey, so uh, we, we don't have to worry about the Islanders on that uh, on that list of top eleven because uh, they're sitting outside of the playoff spot. Right they now. aren't actually. Oh, uh, they aren't. They are barely in. Oh, they have. Is it by a tie? It's a tie. They're yeah. tied with Carolina with sixty-one points on fifty-six games, but the Islanders have one more regulation win. Uh, and okay. Carolina has a couple of overtime losses that make up the mix there, but they are actually technically in as we speak. On this Sunday afternoon. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the only thing I have left on, left on my list is just a request from everyone who likes to message me on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Please stop spoiling games for me. Uh, I know you want to talk hockey with me because it's fun to talk hockey with anyone. <laughs> but right after a Montreal Canadiens game, please do not message me with the results. I watch all of the Canadians games on a delay. So it's come to the point where I can't even have my phone near me, and that sucks. So <laughs> if you want to talk hockey with me about the Montreal Canadiens game that just happened, maybe your team's playing Montreal, send me a message and say, hey, have you watched the game yet? Or did you finish the game? 
That's all you got to say. Don't message me and say, oh, it sucks that your team lost tonight. So if you want to be a spoiler, you got to get permission first. Exactly. Okay. Because it, I mean, if I get spoiled again, I'm just going to unfortunately block the person. Oh, oh, that's, that's drastic. It is drastic, but I've, I've warned the people now, so. Wow. I don't want to be spoiled. You were spoiled all, all your life growing up. I yeah, oh, I was real spoiled. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, that's, that's a, an interesting I wish request. I was spoiled. Oh. oh. I was spoiled when I was real young. Yeah. When, back when I can't even remember. <laughs> I wasn't spoiled in the good years. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah, we'll have a, this conversation will continue <laughs> off the air. <laughs> uh, what, what do you have on your list? I have quite a bit of stuff, actually. And first off, maybe keying into what we talked about just moments ago, which was the various positioning of the standings. If the playoffs were to begin today, and I know this is something you do from time to time, and mm. uh, so right now, Tampa Bay would play the Islanders. And That'd that, be a would, good series. that would be an interesting series because the Islanders and Tampa Bay are both near the top in goals four. Mm. Uh, the Islanders are scoring 3.36 goals per game on average, and the Tampa Bay Lightning are scoring 3.56 goals per game on average. <clears throat> Excuse me where they differ significantly is in goals against. Yeah. So, you know, Tampa Bay would be clearly the favorite there, but it would be an interesting series. There's a lot of storylines there. Um, you'd have Tavares versus Stamkos. Mm -hmm. You'd have the rookies, Brazil versus Sergachev. All kinds of storylines. So it'd be, uh, they have a bit of history. I think they played, was it two years ago? In the I don't know. Or, I mm -hmm. don't remember. I can't remember who the Islanders played after they put out Florida. Anyway. And uh, you've got a, a goaltender like Halak who can bring it in the playoffs when he's in a good He has place. experience. Yeah. Uh, so. Unfortunately, both are a bit inconsistent, mm -hmm. Grice and Halak. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, Tampa's the clear favorite there. But. Yeah. Boston, Toronto. Uh, Boston sitting quite a bit above Toronto in the uh, points and also in games in hand. I don't think I could predict that series. It, it would be tough. It would be really tough. I bet you Boston does not want to face Toronto. No, no, no. I think it's the last team they want to face. Mm -hmm. I think they prefer, I think they would prefer to play Tampa Bay because mm -hmm. I think they can shut Tampa Bay down. But Toronto, they're just so unpredictable. Yeah. And Anderson and Net is just, I wouldn't want to play them. Yeah. No, thanks. Boston's up there in goals for 3.25 goals per game and only 2.38 goals against. Mm -hmm. They're one of the better teams in the league in that department. Uh, Toronto scores a lot, though, 3.21. So They can score whenever they want. Yeah, their goal production is about equal with Boston. It's just on the defensive side where there's a big difference. Yeah. And uh, it would be exciting hockey. It'd be, it would be, I think, a series that would go down in this decade as one of the best playoffs, NHL playoff series mm -hmm. in this entire decade. I would be glued. Oh, yeah, glued. Glued. Uh, on the other side of the equation in the, in the Metro, Washington would right now finish is sitting top spot and they would play the New Jersey Devils if the playoffs were to begin. Yeah. Yeah. Meh. Mm. There's so many other storylines and other series that I'd prefer yeah. to watch. How about the Pittsburgh Philadelphia matchup? Because that's oh the other, that's the other that one. That would be glorious. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So really coming out of the East, there are two really cool series that could happen if this thing stays the same. Mm. That's Boston, Toronto and Pittsburgh, Philly. I'd be cheering hard for Philly. Would hard, you? So hard. I would be cheering. You know what? I probably would too. Unbelievably hard. Now that I think of it. If it was any other opponent, I probably would not. I'd be pacing, I'd be painting Flyers logos on my face. That's how hard I'd be cheering for Philly. <laughs> sorry, Pittsburgh fans. <laughs> and and I should say, sorry, Philadelphia fans, because putting the Flyers logo on that face, I don't know if it's that much for the logo. <laughs> Jeez, thanks. Yeah, no, no problem. I got a face for radio too. I'm glad so. to help. <laughs> All righty. So in the West, uh, in the Western Conference, I guess you'd say, the Central Division, uh, Winnipeg would play St. Louis being second and third. Oh, snap. That would be something else. That would be incredible. In would be. Absolutely incredible. And both in the same time zone, which is cool too. Yes. Right? So that's that's important because it's Definitely. less weirdness with travel. That's a playoff series that I'd like to see in person. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Nashville would play Dallas. That would be a good series as well. I think it would. That Dallas would be a really is, good series. Dallas is so good this last 20 games. They'd be the underdog of that series, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be close. I think it would be a lot closer than people think. Yeah. Uh, San Jose would play the Kings. Battle of California, it in would a be, way. It would be good, but it would be too stressful for me. I don't think I could watch it. <laughs> it would be too stressful. <laughs> and uh, you'd have to stay up late for all. They're in the same time oh, zone, Oh, I'll be staying too. up late. <laughs> 
and Vegas would play the Minnesota Wild. That'd be interesting. Hmm. Not my favorite of series to watch. No, but I, I, I'm going to really be interested in watching Vegas. And I, think, yeah, I think everyone is, even the people who don't like Vegas. Yeah. You got to watch them. Just and that they're going to have at least two games in the central time zone makes mm-hmm. it possible for me to even see a few periods maybe on a weeknight, which mm-hmm. would be fine. And But even Vegas, their home games will probably be at weird hours for Vegasites. Like people who live in Vegas, I think are getting used to going to hockey games at noon. Did you just or, say Vegasites? Yeah, I don't know what they really are, but... I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I th- I'm going to call them Vegasites. It almost sounds like that a... That sounds like a parasite. It does, yeah. It sounds like a, an it, infectious That sounds like a thing. burn. Yeah. But interesting how people's uh, identities are described when they live in a certain city. Like do you, and someone who lives in New York would be a... New Yorker. New Yorker. What about Toronto? Uh, Torontonian. Torontonian. A Montrealer, Winnipegger. Do you know what someone who lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia is? Oh, uh, I used to. It remind me. They're called a Haligonian. Yes, a Haligonian. Uh, I should have known that. I, I, I don't know who makes this stuff or who's in charge of the, the naming thing, but uh, it's mm-hmm. interesting. So I don't, what's someone who lives in Las Vegas called? Uh, let us know in the comments. Yeah, Is it a Vegasite or a Vegaser? Vegatonian. Vegatonian? A vegan? A, v- a vegan. <laughs> a vegan? Vegetarian? <laughs> Is it true that Vegas doesn't have daylight savings time? They switch back and forth between Pacific and It could uh, be. Mountain? I honestly don't know. Several places have time zone weirdness like that. Saskatchewan. I think Phoenix does. Indiana's like that. Indiana does not observe daylight saving time. They switch back and forth. That's Sus- strange. Yeah, it is. Um, I... I'd be quite happy with the same time zone all year long. Heck yeah. Yeah. I don't like the switching thing. No, I think it's silly. Yeah. It's it, it, all, it all evens out in the end. I'd like to be in the Eastern time zone. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I'd love to be in the Eastern time who zone. Who makes this, these decisions? Was it the government of Canada? Yeah, it's, the, it's the time zone commission. <laughs> the time zone commission. <laughs> no, it would be the government. I think each jurisdiction, provincial or state jurisdiction, gets to decide what time zone it wants to be in. Well, they need to get their crap together and fix this. Because <laughs> ain't nobody got time for Atlantic time zone. And like, we think that we have a bad, for those of you who don't know, Newfoundland is a place in Canada. That's east of here. It's east of here, and they are 30 minutes ahead mm-hmm. of us. So when it's 7 p.m. Eastern, it's 8.30 p.m. in Newfoundland. Yeah. How, like, how weird is what? that? What? What? What is the point of that? That's ridiculous. Do you know where they're, they're okay, though, for the next two weeks? Because South Korea is in a half hour time zone as well. So, what? Yeah, South Korea and Newfoundland are now not in the same time zone, but they're, they both hit the top of the hour at the same time. Oh, that's just silly. <laughs> Any, <laughs> anyway, what were we talking about? Uh, talking about Haligonians and, uh, oh, and geography. Oh, Vegas, yeah. just Vegas in Vegas general. Vegas in general, yeah. So Off topic, sorry. Yeah. Vegas would we'll play Minnesota. That'd be all right. That wouldn't be a bad series at all. Who's just outside... That could replace Minnesota. Just outside, knocking on the door, the Calgary Flames are only two points out. In Calgary versus five. Vegas would be all right. That would be. Anaheim is Anaheim and Colorado are tied now at plus eight, so they're only three points out of the wild card right now. Let me let me let me tell you something. Mm-hmm. You tell me something. The Anaheim Ducks. If you are a fan of a team in the West, you better be afraid of the Anaheim Ducks. Mm-hmm. If they make the playoffs, they're going deep. That's my. That's my left field prediction here. You heard it here. Anaheim is going deep. They're most, one down. of the most resilient teams in the league. They always start slow. They always finish strong. And they're always a threat in the playoffs. Boom. Boom. You said Look it. Look out for Anaheim. Right on. You heard it here first. Head to your bookie. Yeah. <laughs> Go see your bookie. All right. So that's where the playoff matchups would be. That will change every day between now mm. and the first week of April. But it'll be fun to visit that once in a while to see how things are going. Probably of all the matchups that are there, the only matchup that seems to be uh, fairly likely is the Boston-Toronto. Unless Boston catches Tampa Bay. Mm. But Boston-Toronto looks like a pretty solid... No one's catching Toronto. So basically, Toronto's going to play Boston or Toronto's going to play Tampa? Yeah. Well, no. Uh, Sorry. Yes, that's right. Toronto will play Boston or because Toronto will play Tampa? That's I, right. I don't yeah. think Toronto's going to be passing both of them. No, that's right. So they won't get a wild Toronto can... Toronto plan for their series right now which mm-hmm. is amazing mm-hmm. that, that it's so early before the trade deadline you're already planning who you're going to play basically is crazy but yeah and you know yeah there's <clears> lots <throat> of games to play but most teams now have played 
in the mid fifties for games, fifty two up to fifty six games all the way down the league. Like the people who think that I don't want to talk about the Canadians again because we talk about them a lot on my favorite team, but I'm gonna use them as an example. Mm-hmm. How many points out of the playoffs are they? Montreal uh, 12? is currently nine points out of well ten points, but about a nine and on the plus minus scale out of the wild card. Ten. Uh, so like people would say, well, ten points isn't very much. That's five games. That's five wins in a row. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but the uh, all of the other teams around those teams are always getting points. So yeah. it's not just about getting five wins in a row. Like you might get five wins, but at least two of those teams will get four of their five wins, and or four to four wins out of their five games. And it's it's not just about getting those ten points. It's about getting. Five wins in a row, lose one, get another five wins in a row, lose one, get another five. Like it's, and it also is about getting five wins in a row, and every team in front of you, yeah, going on a five-game losing streak like at the same time. It's so mathematically, yeah, hard at this point. It's, they're basically ruled out. Then yep. any and any team around. That's why I ruled out Montreal and Ottawa four or five podcasts ago mm-hmm. because mathematically it's just too hard. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. It's on the very rare occasion it happens. Calvary did it last year. Uh, Ottawa did it in 2014, 2015, um, but it, it, it really does not happen very often. No, it's so. very rare, and it's a bit of a magical thing when it happens. Yep. There's no magic in Montreal right now. <laughs> no, there's no, no, there's no magic. Arizona is pretty well. Uh, there's probably not an X next to the team name in the standings when you look at them, but they're probably toast because they have 26 games left. 52 points is all they could get if they won everything from this point forward as if that would ever happen. That means the most points they can get right now is 88 points. And I think Arizona could have been rolled out after the first week. Oh, I, I think so too. The but first when, two weeks, 10 when you games. get two-thirds of the season in yeah. and you look at the remaining games. 88 points. Yeah, the opportunity to change your future decreases every game you play. So if they won every <laughs> single game, they every would single still game. only get 88 points. Yeah, that's, that's right. about. Ten, nine to ten points less than they would need to make the playoffs. Yeah, just to sneak in. Just in my to opinion. sneak in. Be that ninety-seven to ninety-nine range. Yeah, that I, that's unbelievable. It is like that's so bad in a league that's supposed to have the, the reason we have the salary cap and the reason we have, you know, the distribution of teams around the, the continent and all that is for parity. Yeah, and parity is par- key. Parity is key, and I guess you could say that the top two thirds of the league. The middle third of the league is very a lot of parity there. Yes. The top, the top third, and the bottom third, not so much. So the parity area is not very, it's mm-hmm. not as wide as it ought to be for the whole league, right? Yeah, I agree. So anyway, I'm digressing. But there we are. So I have a few other things. Hit me with it. All right, hit you. Uh, firstly, we haven't done a show on this yet, but on Friday night, you and I went to a Charlottetown Islanders game. That'll be a Patreon video. A Patreon video, uh, but uh, we'll do that in a video. But yeah. I must say that we went to it. We'll talk a little bit about it now if we can. We saw the Blainville Bois Briand Armada uh, in town to play the Islanders. The game ended 4 1 on behalf of the visiting team, Blainville Bois Briand. But it was a much closer and better played game than the 4 1 score would suggest. It's basically, it was basically the worst team in the league playing the best team in the league. Um, Islanders aren't the worst team in the league, but they're, they're close. Well, they're. They're in the playoffs. No, no they're not. They are. are they're, they? they're in the playoffs. They're just a couple of points out of having home ice advantage in the first round, actually. Yeah, it's hard to believe. But they're ninth right now out of 16 uh, playoff contenders. I think they're like 3-9 th- and nine in their last 12 games or something like yeah, that. Like they're, they're, not not, play, they're not playing well. Not doing games. well lately, but they, they, they played really well early in the season, so they're still a, taking advantage of some of that good early luck. But the Armada... Is uh, the, the best, best team in the league? Best team in the league, and they look like it. It's they didn't am- look like it actually all game. It's amazing how a team. It was kind of like Ottawa last year in the playoffs. A team that plays such a structured uh, game, and the Islanders played differently than Ottawa did in the playoffs. The uh, the Islanders played a very fast, hard hitting game, mm-hmm. and just wore the team down. Yeah, really. Like the Armada had so much skill and skating ability that they stopped skating because they were scared to get hit. Mm -hmm. And the Islanders just wore them down. And the shot differential at one point was like 30 to 12 or something like that. And the Islanders were all over them. And it it had nothing to do with skill and everything to do with hard work Mm -hmm. and intimidation. 
if you don't count the first minute of the game, where they scored 49 seconds in, Plainville, and you don't count the two empty netters near the end of the game, it was basically a 1-1 game. Mm -hmm. And it was very high, hotly contested. And the, the player for the Blainville Bob, the reason we went to the game was to see this Alex Barre Boulet, mm -hmm. who is undrafted, 20 years old. He's 5'9", 167 pounds. 90-some points in 40-some games. He has 99 points in what are now 50 or 51 games, something like that. He's tearing the league up. He is so far ahead that he can't be seen by the second-place scoring person in the Quebec Major Junior League. I'm going to be saving the rest of my comments for the Patreon video All right. on him. Okay. Uh, the Olympics are on. As we record this, uh, there have been a couple of Olympic women's games in the morning, our time. And hockey. In, hockey games, sorry. Yeah, this is hockey, so. Uh, they, the Ameri Team USA beat, I think it was Finland, but uh, if not Finland, it was another Scandinavian team, 3-1. And then Team Canada played against the Olympic athletes from Russia and beat them, I think, 5 nothing. But it was a really good game. Uh, Canadian gals, they couldn't do much with Russia the first period. They were, it was very hotly contested. Uh, the, the Russian team skated really hard. And the first men's game is on Wednesday? On Wednesday morning, our time, which would be Wednesday evening, uh, Korea time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's Canada versus the Olympic athletes from Russia, I think. Oh. I think they're the first team we play. Uh, maybe not. I might have that wrong. Sure. What, what have you watched so far in the Olympics? <clears throat> I've watched a bit of moguls. Uh, what the heck is that? That's <laughs> that sounds like a Harry Potter thing. <laughs> no, those are muggles. Oh, <laughs> same thing. Moguls is, I, I don't know what the official event name is, it's when you have skis and you go down and they intentionally put all these really short little bumps uh. and so you're bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And then there's a couple of little ramps where you do some flips and things. And So there's a bit of artistic Flip, impression stuff. Flips and things. Flips and things, yeah. You can tell you're really into this sport. Oh, I'm really, it's... You know uh, all the technical stuff, flips yeah. and things. I just know it was really gnarly. <laughs> gnarly. Yeah, but uh, I watched some uh, ladies, yeah, it's a Canadian... Uh, lady skier won a silver medal, which I thought was great. We watched some snowboarding yesterday. We did watch That's some snowboarding. That's the only thing I've watched at the Olympics so far. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I watched some Olympic mixed doubles curling. And that sounds like uh, watching paint dry for you. I, I really don't want to talk about curling. <laughs> I know there's a few people on our Discord who really like curling. Brittany, specifically. Good for Brittany. And uh, I just can't do it. Well, mixed doubles is cool because there's only two, two people. One man and one woman. What the, what's the gender have to do? Like... Switching up the well, genders in curling does not make curling interesting. You, you need the gender thing so it can be properly be mixed. But uh, the weird part is, usually in curling, someone throws the rock. There's two people who go down the ice with it and sweep, and there's a third person or fourth person at the other end who provides the target to throw at. In mixed doubles, sometimes, like John Morris, the Canadian guy, he'll throw the rock and then get right up immediately and sweep his own stone. Wait, his name's John Morris? His name is John Morris. All right. And Caitlin Laws is Can't his partner. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's I I really like watching. This summer when I was volunteering for the uh, bike stuff in PEI, mm -hmm. Chris and I went to uh, the Cove Head Community Center for a stop. We set up tables and stuff and drinks and whatever. And we got there too early, mm -hmm. so we had to kill like an hour there. So we found a cup, it was like a Tim Hortons cup or whatever, and we put it out. I don't know, maybe about 10 feet away from the sidewalk in front of the building. And there's a bunch of little rocks on the ground. And we invented a game called Rock Cup. And we basically just sat there and threw rocks into the cup from far away. I would rather watch Chris throw rocks into a cup than watch a legitimate sport like curling. You're cruel. That's how much I hate curling. You are cruel. It's too slow. It's <clears throat> it's chess. Yeah, And that's why I hate chess. <laughs> I don't have time for that. There's so many other th productive things I could be doing. <laughs> well, we're all God's children. Everyone's different. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple more items I have. Uh, this is not hockey related, but something you and I both uh, did this week. Although we weren't in the same place at the time. I was on a bus and you were home. That Falcon Heavy rocket launch was unbelievable. Unbelievable. I... I want to ask you what the most special part of that whole thing was. And I'm going to name a couple. <clears throat> so the launch itself mm -hmm. and the motion of it actually lifting off mm -hmm. and hearing it 
mm-hmm. lift off, mm-hmm. which is amazing. Um, the double landing of the uh, secondary boosters. Okay. Or the view of the car when it uh, released its casing. Uh, and you could see the world in the background. So of those three, which was your favorite? Of those three, I think the double landing was the coolest thing. I have, my, my favorite time of the entire launch, though, was one that's not on that list. Oh. Now, I loved all those things. I loved the launch. The the the, uh, the absolute power of those three rockets, all just 27 inches, just going crazy. If, if you guys haven't seen it, please go watch you it. You must watch wear it. Wear headphones, wear the best headphones you have, turn up the volume, and just listen to the unbelievable roar. Incredible. It was. The next time, you know, we could ever get a, plan a trip to Florida, we'll have to try to plan it around a possible launch of that thing mm. next time, because it's amazing. I, I, have, I must see that in person. I have to before I die. It's got to gotta happen. Dude in the car was amazing. Uh, have, you seen, have you seen the recent pictures of it? Well, there's nothing too recent, because after 12 hours, the camera battery died. And there's what? No, there's no solar panels, so we will not see any more images after 12 hours from You're launch. kidding me. I'm not kidding you. Who made that decision? Uh, Elon Musk. He's the guy, it was his $90 million, so I guess he gets to decide. So he spent $90 million putting a car, or he spent, well, how much is the car? Like 700000 or something A Tesla stupid? car, yeah, so probably something like that. The it's Roadster? a Roadster, yeah. yeah. Um, so and he, didn't, he, did, he couldn't afford some solar panels, which one of his products is roof tilings that are solar panels. <laughs> You're telling me that he couldn't afford to put some solar panels on the car itself or something? I, I likely... Uh, I highly doubt it was a lack of ability to afford, because we're talking about Elon Musk here, probably one of the richest men in the world. But it was probably, if I might venture a guess, it was the lack of ability to incorporate all of that engineering together in the in the package to be launched. It's To have solar panels, for instance, you can't just put solar panels on something because the solar panels have to be driven by a little motor that always keeps them facing the sun. And there has to be a gyroscope and there has to be servos. And so it's not just throwing a solar panel on the trunk of a car and expecting it's going to work because it's in the shade quite a bit of the time. So I, I understand that. Okay. But uh, it could be done. It's mm-hmm. like we're talking about rocket science. You right. tell me that you can't put an, an actuating solar panel in the backseat of that car that turns a little bit? I'm not saying you can't do it. If, su- if sunflowers can do it by themselves, we sure as heck better been, been able to do that. In launching this rocket, all he wanted to do was get some really cool ad photos that he can use for marketing. And he got them. He did. Yeah, He got them. He did. And I know he wasn't thinking of you. Uh, he he wanting, should have been. <laughs> wanting to watch this six months from now. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed as well that it was only a battery-powered thing mm. uh, and that the battery has now run out. However, it is what it is. I just thought the, the, vis- the visions we got from that launch was just amazing. And when the fairing broke away and showed that dude sitting there in the car. Yeah, it was incredible. And then it, the, the view looking forward over her shoulder, <clears throat> and there's a display in the Tesla that says, don't panic. Yeah, don't panic. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Now, what did I like even more than all of those things? And this is because I'm a bit of a space geek. This is such an exciting moment, and everybody working on this was so excited. But the people running the countdown for that last 30 seconds or 60 seconds, the calmness in their voice as they're proceeding to this countdown. And one guy, I think it's the launch director, comes on and says, you know, uh, Falcon is configured for launch. Like, it's just so deadpan. I'm just like... To me, that was the coolest thing because you can, you know, that the adrenaline must oh, be yeah. just coursing through these people. And their underwear is filled with massive amounts of poo. <laughs> Falcon is configured for launch. Yeah, I just yeah. thought that was the coolest part. They I were, love Countdown. They were pretty, uh, pretty cool. And, they and were calm very and cool. I wish I could be half that cool on my best day. Do you have anything else planned to, to talk about? A uh, couple more things, but okay, I'm gonna. I have for those who can't see, I've, I've brought up the launch. I've primed it to the time where it lifts off i'm going to try and feed the audio into the mixer into here and at the end of the podcast maybe we'll play it you guys sure. can hear it if you haven't heard it before. that'd be great so, yeah. yeah it's it's tremendous just tremendous uh, a couple of other quick hit items mm-hmm. uh you know how much i like nascar i do today is the clash and the qualifying for the daytona 500 which is next weekend so wasn't there truck racing on 
couple no, days might have been. Might have been. Don't know. Is that cons- what do they call it NASCAR? Oh yeah, tr- the Truck Series. The wheel it's used like, to be so called it's NASCAR Truck Series. Yeah, it used to be called the Craftsman Truck Series. Right, I don't think it is now, yeah. but uh, Sears used to sponsor it. So. Sears. Sears. Yeah, I think. I think in the states they still have Sears, but we don't anymore. Yeah, she's. Uh, is it officially closed now? It's done. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Some stores hung on later than others, but I think they were all toasted some by sometime in January. I meant to go in and see if I could buy some wax for jerseys. <laughs> Yeah, because I got nowhere to hang in now. So, yeah, that's right. Oh well, We're getting a little light, but yeah. So I can't wait. New paint schemes, new drivers, and new cars. I'm looking forward to that. There's, I've already seen Chase Elliott in the new number nine. Looks beautiful. So that's great. Who's his sponsor? Uh, the one he's got for the clash today is Mountain Dew. Ah. Uh, so that'll be interesting. But I don't think that's the permanent sponsor. But we'll see. And uh, I guess we haven't talked about that yet, and we haven't done the fish. Uh, oh, right, the fish bowl. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, you reach in there and pick out a fish. Oops, I just got Patrick Marlowe bobbing his head there. What's going on here? I don't know. All right, you got the fish. Roll the intro. Alrighty, someone has submitted the question, uh, what is your favorite hockey memory of all time? Mm. That's a really good question. Uh, in, in, the, in person hockey memory or on TV hockey just memory in general. or both? Just in, in general. general. I think my favorite hockey memory has to be the 1971 Stanley Cup uh, win by the Montreal Canadiens over Chicago. Mm-hmm. It wasn't supposed to happen. Montreal wasn't supposed to be, even be competitive, and they beat the Blackhawks, and mm. it was fantastic. I think you, I think we talked about that yeah. a couple of times before. What about in person? In person, uh, probably watching uh, the California Golden Seals or the Oakland Seals be beat eight four by the Canadians with my dad. It wasn't watching me play hockey when I was younger. Oh, oh, oh it was watching you play hockey when you were younger, <laughs> especially that one game you played as goalie. And you won. Heck yeah. And you were scared after that because you'd won that game and you thought they'd make you a goalie and and you wouldn't have a chance to not play goalie after that because you'd won that game. And we have that on video. That seems weird because I think I always wanted to be a goalie. Yeah, but not... not like any time I played outdoor hockey or ball hockey or mm-hmm. in the house, I and, was always goalie. Well, I'll, I'll go back. You're probably about seven or eight at the time. And I think what you didn't want to be a goalie why you didn't want to be a goalie is because when you won, the team would pile on you. Right. And you would get claustrophobic by being at the bottom <laughs> of the pile on because you've won uh, as a goalie. And I think that scared you from being a goalie at that That's time. That's so anyway. strange. <laughs> That's and unfortunate. We, we have that on video. I, I videoed that. Really? So I have a video of you skating to shake hands with the other team. I don't think I've ever seen that. As a goalie. Yeah. I, it's there somewhere. It's somewhere in one of our tapes. I'll find mm. it. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, that was probably a decision that you were relieved about because goal equipment wasn't cheap. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. and we were things were pretty tight back then. Yeah, so. that's why I said I was spoiled in my earlier years and not my fun years. <laughs> um, my favorite hockey memory of all time. I don't know if I have one. Like that 2006 series, uh, just in the entire playoffs in general. Watching Edmonton go on the run that they did, and end up facing Carolina. That was a really special time. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Montreal did with, I think that's it. In 2010, when Montreal beat Pittsburgh, and Montreal Montreal beat Washington first, and then beat Pittsburgh in the second round, mm-hmm. those two s- series wins were unbelievable because they were the underdog, so much the underdog, mm-hmm. and they beat they beat the the Washington Capitals and the Pittsburgh Penguins, and uh, I've never been happier as a hockey fan, and never been more disappointed two weeks later when they lost to Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So. I guess that's it, but I, I'd have to also as a second choice the Golden Goal, uh, oh, yeah. twenty ten. Yeah. Uh, that was definitely. I remember watching that, you know, just right upstairs from where we are now, and uh, being so excited seeing that goal get scored. That was uh, that was stressful. Oh well, yeah. That the, was that was stressful. The outcome was very much in doubt. It was. If it had been against a different country, mm-hmm. I think it would have been less stressful. But yeah. because it was against the United States, uh, the all our, our our ultimate rivals, so much was on the line. Mm-hmm. Not just in hockey, just like I don't think Canada gets compared to the United States of who's the better 
a lot, but we're neighbors, and there is some, some comparison that goes on, so we needed to win that game. Speaking of neighbors, um, right now Canada and the United States are negotiating the future of trade between the two countries. Yes, NAFTA or whatever. And one, Yeah, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And one of the things that we're having as a contentious issue is the duties that the Americans want to put on softwood lumber. Yes. And softwood lumber is a huge export from New Brunswick, where we're from. Mm -hmm. And it's a big part of the New Brunswick economy. And New Brunswick wants desperately to reduce the Americans' duty on softwood lumber. And there's lots of people working on that. And we've had exemptions in the past, and maybe we can still get exemptions. But even though there's a lot of tension, and this, does, this isn't a bribe or anything, but there's a philanthropist in the Fredericton area who recently passed away. But before he died, he bought a desk at an auction. And he asked that that desk be sent to Washington to be put in a museum. The desk belonged to, uh, I don't know if he was an admiral or a captain, but he was a naval uh, commander in the War of 1812, and his last name was Farragut. And That name sounds familiar. Sorry. Yeah, Farragut was part of the story, but um, it might be Decatur. It's Decatur, actually. That name sounds familiar, too. Yeah. Anyway... The desk belonged to this guy, and it was captured in the War of 1812 by the British. It eventually went through several hands and was purchased at an auction by this guy for the express purpose of getting it back to the States. And it went back uh, just this past week. The New Brunswick uh, Lieutenant Governor arranged for this desk mm. to be sent back, and it's going to now be in Decatur House in Washington, D.C., which is part of the overall White House Museum. Uh, the, this thing's over 200 years so old. So it's a bit of a, a wood peace offering. Maybe so. Maybe so. That, you know, it's it's a property that they rightfully should have. Right. The interesting thing is that for several years, until they were arranging this transportation of the desk, it sat at the lieutenant governor's mansion in Fredericton, which mm -hmm. is the government house that was built in 1828, I think it was. So it's a really old building. It's on Woodstock Road there. And uh, the desk sat in a display area, and on the desk were pictures of the royal family. So this is the desk that the American naval commander used to draw up his plans to attack the British Navy. Yeah. And we use that desk to display pictures <laughs> of, you know, Prince William and Princess Kate and all the kids and Oops. Or yeah. So that was kind of funny that that was we used it for that. Not and on purpose, just that's what it ended up being that used seems for. Seems like us. a weird thing to to use as a trophy. Mm. <laughs> like you have to think back then it wasn't easy moving stuff around because no. the transportation is not like it was today mm -hmm. and you're going to take the biggest thing you can find which is probably a desk you want that as your trophy and i know that someone some commander or someone said yeah i want that brought back to canada and all the little grunts and the canadian grunts who weren't canadian at the time but yeah. they're like oh my god you seriously want us to bring this back to canada this big giant desk can't you pick like a a bullet casing or something? like What had happened, uh, Decatur and his second-in-command were both on a ship that t captured a British frigate uh, in uh, the War of 1812. So that And they commandeered. His buddy went on the British frigate, and the two of them uh, sailed back to the U.S., uh. and this desk went back, and he gave the desk to his second-in-command, and the desk then ended up, I think, being... Uh, uh, co-opted or, or taken or sold off or whatever. Anyway, it's ah. finally back in the family where it belongs. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, I said bullet casing back there, but I guess there wouldn't be no bullet casings back then because they'd be using... I think they'd be using muskets. muskets. Yeah, yeah, I don't think bullets were really a thing until several decades after that. Hmm. We're not experts in firearms. Nope. <laughs> we're Canadians. <laughs> um, all right, you got anything else? I actually don't think I do. I think I'm tapped out. All right. Well, um, we can talk about this little gem here. We've oh, right. We've already yes. displayed it in the mail time. But for those of you who didn't watch the mail time, we got a nice little gift here from Mulligan. It is the the goal horn light, uh, goal light with the horn. There's 30 teams on the back, all of them except for Vegas. And you can program it to play your favorite team's horn. So we put it in the man cave and every time Montreal scores, which is not very often. Yeah, the batteries will last a long time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we get to light it up. So I'd like to light it up here for you guys now. And I don't think it'll be too loud for you guys, but if it is, I apologize. So you notice that it is the Montreal Canadiens 
themed goal horn. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. So it does that a few times and then it stops. Yeah, I think it only does two horns. Yeah. Thanks a lot to Mulligan uh, for that. That's it's perfect for the it's man cave. It's sweet, yeah. It's awesome. We're, we're thinking of mounting it because I think it mounts as it does, well. Yep. You can put it on the ceiling or on a wall. So we're going to mount it in such a way that it's a, a very uh, popular and permanent fixture. Absolutely. In the man cave. Yeah, definitely. And hopefully it'll get lots of use, but <laughs> not not in the near future. Now we might have to change the horn to a different team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, I, don't talk like that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to play this uh, this launch here. It might be take me a, just a little bit to get the audio correct. Um, so be patient. I'm going to start at the, the uh, with 22 seconds left on the countdown, so you hear a little bit of chatter. Hopefully, X fucking heavy. Go for launch. Falcon Heavy is configured for flight. T minus 15, stand by for terminal count. And nine, eight. Side boost ignition. Six, five, four, three, two, one, two. Ignition. I got to say, when I was watching that, you were home, and I was at a bus stop mm -hmm. when that went off. It went off at exactly quarter to five, which is when the bus stops and picks me up. So I have headphones in. I'm watching my phone, and I'm watching YouTube's feed from Elon Musk's SpaceX company. And I'm standing there by myself with these earphones in, watching this, quite moved and excited by this uh, amazing launch. And I'm standing there probably doing something like, go baby, go baby, <laughs> watching my phone. And I just hope now that people realize that we're driving by, that I was actually watching a rocket launch and not something else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true, right? And even after the, the bus picked me up, I'm sitting in the bus near the front and I'm watching because we're waiting for the two uh, side rockets to stop, to have engine cut off and then separate mm -hmm. for the landing back on the earth. I watched the whole thing on the bus. And it just, when I think about the Saturn V launches I watched when I was a kid, of, you know, the moon shots in the late 60s and early 70s, have to watch them on a black and white TV, oh, yeah. you know, grainy, scratchy images. And now, not that much later, because I'm not that old, really. Come on. Mm. Uh, I'm sitting on a bus in a city yeah. watching a <laughs> rocket launch on my phone. Like, how much has the world changed? It's, it's incredible. A, yeah. But that is the same. And your phone has like 100 times more capable, probably oh, yeah. more than 100 times, probably like 10,000 times more computing capability than they used to send their, that original Saturn V to yeah. the moon. Or than so, the flight computer on Apollo 13 had. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, oh, yeah, it's so. incredible. It's uh, But the rocket launch itself is still as, as impressive and emotional as it always was. Yeah. I want to try and play you guys... Um, uh, a clip of the audio of just the, the launch from binaural headphones. Oh, okay. Uh, you've already seen this, um, but... No, I don't think I have. Oh, you haven't? No. All right, listen to this. So the audio is going to be a little delayed here because the photographer is quite far away. was the smarter everyday guy who was actually there uh he had a photographer there wow he talks about later on um when the boosters come down to launch there is down uh, to land you mean uh sorry down, yeah down to land <laughs> well down to down to land and then to launch mm -hmm. again yeah um there's s sonic booms mm -hmm. when they're coming down and they're supposed to be 
I think six or eight, maybe. I don't know. Uh, one for the top of the rocket, um, three down for the launch feet or the stabilizers or whatever you want to call okay. them. Um, so each rocket should have four. And so they're coming down together. So it's boom, 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 boom. As a, so you, you hear it. He can hear it in, in this. But it's actually five. And he can't figure out why. And uh, it's because of the echo. He They're kind of over, overlapping a little bit. All right. Um, but I'll, I won't show you that now. But mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'll look at I'll it later. Yeah. I'll show you when we stop this podcast. It's it's pretty damn cool. <laughs> Anyways, there was a lot of off-topic uh, conversation in this podcast. I uh, hope you guys didn't mind too much. Um we had fun, so mm -hmm. hopefully you did too. Yeah. Uh, so thank you guys very much for watching on YouTube. If you are, hit that like button. If you're new, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening on iTunes, thank you very much for uh, making us a part of your uh, audio experience. Uh, whether you're in a car driving to work or on your lunch break at work or on a bus. Stuck um, in traffic on the Major Deegan Expressway. Wherever that is and wherever you are, uh, <laughs> thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Um, next week, we will have lots to talk about uh, as we approach the trade deadline. Uh, that'll be podcast number 20, or sorry, number 36, number 26. Uh, so guys, thank you very much for watching. Appreciate it, and we'll catch you in the next one. Adios.